Hi, everyone. It is episode 26 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by actual FBI cases. In this interview, we talk to Sam Smimo. Now, Sam served a total of 26 years working in federal law enforcement. The first 10 and a half years were with the United States Marshal Service, chasing down and hunting dangerous fugitives. And the last 15 and a half years was with the FBI. Initially, during his FBI career, Sam was working drug cases. And he talks to us about a case in which he was able to exonerate and get released from jail an innocent man who had been wrongly accused of shooting a child during a drive-by shooting. Identifying and bringing the real culprit to justice was a highlight of Sam's career working drug cases. But after witnessing the devastation caused by the tragic events of 9-11, Sam was compelled to raise his hand and to volunteer to transition from fighting the war on drugs to fighting the war on terror. He tells us about working on an extraterritorial case wherein the FBI and the American government desperately attempted to locate and rescue a U.S. citizen kidnapped in Saudi Arabia. Tragically, the American businessman was executed by an al-Qaeda terrorist organization operating in the Arabian Peninsula. Before we get to that interview, I just want to give a shout out to the Drexel University students that I met with earlier this week. I was there talking to the communication class about interviewing techniques and giving presentations. As you may recall, in addition to giving presentations on economic fraud, scams, greed, and corruption, I'm also asked to talk about interviewing techniques and crisis communications because of my post-bureau career working as the director of media relations for SEPTA, Philadelphia's public transportation agency. I have something very exciting and something very scary to talk to you about. When I went to Thriller Fest, I talked to a book marketing and social media expert. Lynn, if you're listening, thank you for the advice. It's very scary, but I think I will take your advice and offer my listeners uh, free copies of the ebook version of Pay to Play, my novel about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. It could mean I could give away 500 copies, 5,000 copies, 10,000 copies. So it's very scary. I don't know who's going to take me up on the offer, but of course there's a catch to it. I'm offering the free ebook version of my novel in exchange for you becoming a member of my launch team. We'll talk about that a little bit more after the interview. Here's the show. Hi, everyone. I want to welcome my guest, Sam Smimo. Hi, Sam. Hi, Jerry. Sam, it's great to have you here today. I know you've had a full career working a variety of totally different violations. But first, tell us about you. Give us an idea on what you were doing that brought you to the FBI that enabled you to be able to work uh, these cases so successfully. I'd be happy to, Jerry. Uh, unlike uh, a lot of uh, FBI agents, uh, I wasn't one of those who dreamt about being an FBI agent from being a little kid. I didn't have any family members in law enforcement, so I really, uh, really hadn't given it much thought. I was in uh, college, and I was kind of floundering, deciding uh, what I wanted to do when I took a crime scene investigations course, the CSI course, just on a whim. And uh, I had a fantastic professor, and by the time I got halfway through the course, I I knew this is what I wanted to do for work the rest of my life. So I kind of uh, focused on that my senior year of college. uh, I was able to get an internship, uh, and uh, it turned out to be a great internship with Metro-Dade Police Department. Uh, Now it's Miami-Dade Police Department. Great internship. I went throughout the department, worked... uh, homicide, sexual battery, a lot of others. And uh, when I graduated, um, I pretty much knew I wanted to try to become an FBI agent. I knew that it was hard to get in the FBI with uh, they would like to see some some years of uh, career type experience. So I applied to, to uh, uh, a number of federal agencies, uh, applied with the uh, Miami-Dade Police Department, and uh, I was quickly hired by them 
They actually took me on, gave me a job working in the sexual battery unit, uh, waiting on the next uh, police academy. And uh, Mm -hmm. so I spent uh, two or three months working sexual battery cases with detectives there. It was a great experience. I rolled into the uh, police uh, academy. They had a very long academy. It was nine months long. About six wow. months into the uh, police academy, I got called by the, uh, the U.S. Marshal Service, and uh, they offered me a, a position. That was probably the hardest decision I had to make at that time. I really enjoyed uh, the police academy and, and, and the local law enforcement, but I knew my ultimate goal was to get in the FBI, and I felt getting a, a foot in the door with a federal agency was the right thing to do at such a such a young age, so I, I went ahead and, and jumped uh, jumped over and accepted the uh, uh, deputy U.S. marshal position. Yeah, I would imagine that was hard to make that decision. Uh, had to be kind of difficult. Yeah, it was extremely difficult. And when you're in those academies and you spend so much time with you know with your fellow officers there, uh, you know, and I had every intention of uh, you know being a police officer at that point, and uh, um, so I got very close with them, and I was absolutely enjoying that work. I loved it. I loved the academy. You know, it was great. And I I could very easily have seen myself uh, uh, working, you know, for the police department for a long time. But I loved investigation. That was my driving force. And, uh, you know, and the FBI was my ultimate goal there. And I just, uh, you know, I had to weigh what would offer me a better opportunity to get into the FBI. And at the time, I thought it was to go ahead and get my foot in the door with the federal agency. So I I took the marshal's position. For the marshal's position, were you still assigned in the Miami-Dade area? Actually, I wasn't. (laughs) They they sent me out to uh, San Francisco, California. (laughs) So. <laughs> you can't get much further away from Florida than California, Northern California. No, they, no, I couldn't. Um, but uh, I actually uh, very much enjoyed it out there. Um, I worked out there for a year when I was able to make it, uh, make my way back to to Miami, and uh, it took me about a year uh, more working in Miami, a uh, year or so before I was able to get uh, full time into the. Uh, the fugitive squad where I I remained until I uh, ended up uh, leaving for the FBI. That was a goal of yours, too, to to be on the fugitive squad? Yeah, when I got with the marshals, uh, you know, the marshal service uh, does a number of things. They have the witness protection program. They uh, uh, transport prisoners. They protect uh, judges. They do uh, seizures and response civil seizures and court-ordered seizures of properties and so forth. Um, and then they do federal fugitives. And, uh, you know, that was really the, the, the only significant investigative work they did. And that was, uh, like I said, kind of my driving force. So, uh, I wanted to make my way, uh, there as, uh, quick as I could. So I was able to get into the, uh, they called the warrant squad in Miami. And I worked at, uh, uh, from then on and, uh, and I really, uh, enjoyed and loved the work. It took me, to a lot of places and uh, worked some great cases. There were some great fugitive cases uh, down in Miami. Uh, the whole time, though, I was obviously trying to, uh, you know, I knew I wanted to get on the FBI. And initially, when I had gone through the process uh, during that time period, it takes, you know, takes time to get on uh, with the FBI. And and I got caught up in the end when I got through everything with one of the, the famous government uh, freezes that they have. By the time uh, it was unfrozen, I basically had to start the process over. So I, uh, I was determined, though, and I, you know, I knew what I wanted to do. So I went back, uh, uh, reapplied again, went back through the whole process again. And uh, this time, uh, I got a, a position with the FBI as a special agent. And how long were you with the Marshals before that happened? So I ended up doing a, a little over 10 years uh, with the Marshals. And uh, like I said, the last uh, eight or so working uh, federal fugitive investigations. All right. So you have all of this federal law enforcement training. I know the answer to this, but <laughs> for others, does that mean that you don't have to go to the FBI Academy? You, you know everything about federal law enforcement? Yeah. <laughs> No, uh, that certainly is uh, is not the case. So, um, 
yeah, so I actually went down to uh, to Quantico, and as as you uh, as you know, you're lucky enough when you're down there that uh, they allow you to provide a prioritized list of field offices that you would like your first office uh, to be. And uh, there's at the time there's 56 field offices, and uh, Philadelphia was uh, number 46 on my list. Coming from South Florida, uh, wasn't a fan of the cold, so it wasn't uh, it wasn't that high up there. So when I got Philadelphia, I actually found out later there was actually some rhyme or reason to it. The uh, no, I know, I know, I know. The blind monkey with a dart. <laughs> it was not the result of the blind monkey, to my surprise. Um, okay. Actually, when I was with the with the marshals, I was on the national SWAT team that they had for uh, a little over seven years, and. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be sent to the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California to learn Spanish. So I came out of there a level three Spanish speaker. And at the time I was in Quantico, the drug squad supervisor in Philadelphia uh, was looking for a Spanish speaking agent and actually wrote to the academy, wrote to Human Resources. uh, And that is what gave me my uh, direct ticket to Philadelphia. And I think that's something that you know, people need to understand there is a motto and it's always for the good of the Bureau. So you may have, you know, some desires and some thoughts about what you would like to do as far as working or being assigned. And the bottom line is it's whatever is good for the Bureau. What did you have on your top three? Oh, I know Miami was one. Um, I had pending cases there and so forth. Uh, but, uh, uh, I'm trying. It was probably all Florida. It was probably yeah, Miami, Miami Tampa, Tampa, something like that. Jacksonville, something like that. Yeah, and you got Philly. And I got Philly, but I tell you what, uh, this became my home, and uh, uh, you know, I absolutely loved it here, and uh, and I absolutely loved the Philadelphia office, and I'm sure you've heard that from other agents in Philadelphia that you've spoken to. Oh, I, I say it, you know, all the time. Um, love Philadelphia, and love the Philadelphia office. Mm-hmm. All right, so. When you so I went to the uh, the drug squad and I worked uh, I worked on the drug squad uh, approximately uh, uh, five years or so. All right, so now let's get into one of those cases. We'll we'll start off with a drug case first, if that's okay. Yeah, no, I, I'd love to. There's a uh, um, there was a, a number of things about this uh, uh, case that uh, stood out. I, I'll talk about near the end, uh, you know, one of the things I'm uh, most proud of. But uh, basically, uh, when I was working on the drug squad, we ended up uh, putting together a uh, quasi uh, marijuana task force that we called it. And uh, we got a, uh, involved in a case where we <coughs> received information from our uh, El Paso office. And basically, the FBI had information that there was a uh, an eighteen wheeler truckload full of marijuana uh, that had uh, originated in from one of the Mexican cartels, and it had come over and it was designated for uh, for Philadelphia. So obviously, uh, myself and uh, the group of us that that, that worked uh, these type of cases were you know really gung ho to. To take that, we knew uh, that it was 1,500 pounds of marijuana. Well, at the time, a pound of marijuana in Philadelphia went for uh, for about a thousand dollars. So we're talking, you know, a million to a million and a half dollars worth of weed. <laughs> so uh, we knew that. It, so, so how many pounds did you say? Uh, 1,500. Wow. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, you know, a truckload, eighteen wheeler load of uh, of marijuana. So we knew in order to uh, successfully distribute and sell that that amount of marijuana in Philadelphia, there had to be a major DTO or drug trafficking organization in Philadelphia to distribute that. So we were very eager to try to identify as many and as much of that organization as we could. And obviously, uh, you know, try to try to take it, take it down and uh, dismantle it. So that that was our goal coming in. And uh, we were very excited, uh, uh, you know, to to run with this case. So the one of the first things that that stands out to me was uh, this was uh, I believe it was in December. And uh, we we get the uh, the truck uh, is is delivered down to the Philadelphia area. 
and uh, it was absolutely freezing. And there was probably somewhere between three to five feet of snow on the ground off the side of the road. And basically, we were waiting for whoever was with the Philadelphia Drug Organization to come and and pick up this truck that had been uh, uh, left there waiting for uh, the connection to be made. So So they just drove the truck to a particular area and then abandoned it. So the truck was basically left and the connection, uh, you know, we knew they were reaching out, you know, to the organization, but we didn't know uh, exactly who was going to respond and take it. You know, so we uh, we uh, obviously wanted to follow that truck. And when the when the marijuana was delivered, identify and take down as many people as we could. Like I said, it was uh, it was very cold out. So I, uh, you know, obviously we got as uh, as many agents as we could uh, work in this. And we had them all over the all over the city because we had no idea where this truck was going to going to end up going. Did you have some way to identify? Did you have a license plate or markings on the truck? Yes, we we actually knew everything about the truck and we had uh um, you know, we, we had basically had construction constructed, the FBI had constructed possession of the, of the truck at one time. So we had verified that there was 1500 pounds of marijuana in this truck. So, okay, you got to back up and tell us what constructive, constructive possession. Well, when, what that comes into play is, um, and, and I'll, I'll hit on it before, but one of the, the, the first rules and the first concerns you have in in working drug investigations is you can't let the drugs walk. So, you know, in this case, the FBI had at some point control of this amount of drugs. So the the bottom line is, you know, we could not let these drugs walk. So we had to have uh, very close surveillance and control to make sure that the, the drugs as they were being delivered and so forth did not escape, you know, did not get away from us. So when we were uh, waiting for uh, somebody from the Philadelphia DTO to to pick them up, I had agents all over the place. It was very cold. And anyone who works drugs knows it usually turns into a hurry up and wait. Uh, You get out in place and drug dealers do not have schedules and you never know how long they're going to take before they actually make the uh, transaction. And many times the transaction never occurs. So, so we were out there, uh, sitting on, on this for a long time and people were out in their vehicles in the, you know, in extremely cold weather for many hours. But eventually, uh, the truck was picked up and, uh, they started heading into, uh, North Philadelphia. They stopped at a, uh, a residence. And that's, uh, when we had a, the, the first little curveball, um, where, they were unloading the marijuana from the back. We identified a couple people from the, uh, we'll call it a stash house that was, uh, uh, unloading the marijuana. Uh, but they only unloaded a partial amount of the marijuana, closed the doors and we're getting ready to move on. So now you have to make a call here because of what mm. I said about not letting the drugs walk. You had to, you know, we had to make a call of what are we going to do? Do we take it down right now? Or do we do what we wanted to do, which was let it continue to make the next delivery, hopefully don't uh, deliver it all, and then we can identify even more uh, people in this organization. So that's what we ended up doing. We ended up leaving agents there surveilling the, the marijuana that uh, and the location that it had been unloaded to. Obviously, they knew if... Uh, if them, if they felt that anyone was going to remove it, they had to take it down because of not letting the drugs walk. But we were able to uh, maintain that surveillance, take it to its next location to be delivered. And I believe, if my recollection is correct, they did another partial delivery. Wow. Uh, so, so, you, so three times. We did the same thing. And it, the third location is where they emptied all the drugs. We, uh, we simul- simultaneously, uh, hit the, the, the stash houses at that time and were able to arrest a no, large number of people involved in this uh, drug tracking organization. The one thing that was uh, disappointing was in, in one of the locations, there was one subject who was able to escape. As we f- 
continued the investigation uh, following that and into the night we were able to determine that the person who escaped happened to be the head of this uh, North Philadelphia drug trafficking organization. Uh, his name was Joaquin Rosa. They called him Cuba. So, so that was disappointing. We had, we had grabbed a, a, a bunch of people, um, but we had actually uh, uh, missed the head. As these things go, we worked all night through the night into the next morning processing, you know, all the, all the drugs, processing the, the subjects and, and doing all the things that, that agents do. And by morning time, um, I had some keys that I had to take back to uh, the head of the DTO, Joaquin Rosa. I had to take it back to his, uh, to his mother's house. We had keys that we, we did not need for the investigation. I knew they would want them. So I grabbed a, a detective uh, who was working in the other drug squad, Tom Zelensky, and we headed over uh, to the mother's house uh, the following morning. And uh, as luck would have it, as we made the corner, guess who walked out of mom's house? No. And it's just the two of you. Just the two of us. So uh, we were uh, extremely fortunate. And, uh, you know, Tom and I uh, were able to grab him and uh, lock him up. Oh, you got to give us a little bit more details. Grab him. What did you do? <laughs> well, he uh, he uh, I mean, as soon as we make the corner, the timing couldn't have been better. He walked out. And as soon as I saw him, you know, I knew without there was no question. I knew it was him. There was no time to really call for backup. Uh, he was going to get to his car. I didn't want him to get to his car. We pulled right up on him, you know, jumped out. I took him at gunpoint. He was compliant. We took him down and, uh, you know, handcuffed him, arrested him. His, you know, his family came out, but uh, Tom was able to uh, get on the radio and uh, get, get Philadelphia back up there quickly. And, and we had our man. So uh, that was a, you know, a success. It was great to, to get him after that disappointment. And uh, in the end, we were able to prosecute, pretty much convict everyone involved in that, that drug trafficking organization, which, you know, had been, uh, had been operating in North Philadelphia for some time. Which, no, it seems strange that just the, the day after, you know, this huge takedown of his organization, that he would go to his mother's house. One of the first places anybody would look for, you know, a, a fugitive. I, I found it incredibly uh, surprising, too. If I recall, I believe he made a statement, something to the effect that it was a Saturday and didn't expect us to be working <laughs> on a Saturday. There was something in the, uh, like that that was said. But uh, oh, he, he uh, really believed in the government workers <laughs> that uh, it was like a nine to five. Uh, he had no idea that uh, that might have been the case. But all I know is uh, I, I don't know why he made that decision, but we were very fortunate that he did. And, uh, and I'm sure, sure glad that he did. Let uh, me ask you another question. You were you mentioned that this was a task force and you also mentioned that you were with a, another detective. So tell us a little bit more about this task force and who was on it. Well, we and had, how it worked. Yeah, we there was um, the way we worked in the uh, the drug squad at the time. We had Latin American and Caribbean uh, drug cases, and, and we were working heroin, cocaine. Uh, but we just happened to come on to some some large scale uh, uh, marijuana cases, and uh, as a result of that, an agent that I was working with, you know, had the idea of, of you know putting this together as a as a marijuana task force, and uh, we brought one of the Philly detectives who was uh, assigned to our squad, uh, permanently worked it with my partner. And then we used the, uh, we had uh, at the time the Hotel Interdiction Group, which you may have uh, be familiar with, but uh, uh, we actually brought agents who were on, on that squad, and, and they used to work a lot with us when, uh, when we worked these cases too. So um, so it was kind of a, a, a small task force. It was the idea of, uh, of my partner at the time. And, uh, and we were kind of just, uh, for a while there, we were just focusing on some of these uh, large-scale marijuana trafficking organizations. Are you able to define for us uh, the hotel uh, interdiction group, exactly what they did? Well, Whatever you're comfortable too with. Too much detail, since I, I don't know how, uh, how sensitive they, uh, right. they feel that is. But basically, uh, there was a group that was working uh, a lot of cases that were initiated from drug dealers who were coming from uh, from out of state and would stay at local hotels a lot, uh, 
in around Philadelphia, and uh, they would get leads and uh, um, would initiate cases uh, from there, and they led to some some big cases. But uh, I'd, I'd rather not get into too much detail. Okay, I, I understand. That's one thing that uh, I do not want to do is give away any secrets. <laughs> And it sounded like this was a DTO that you were not aware of at the time. No, I so wasn't. Was kind of- and actually, Jerry, one of the things I wanted to highlight was uh, really as a result of this, one of the things it led to, which is, like I said before, is one of the things I'm most proud of. So, you know, as a follow up to this and we're, you know, as we're researching and and thoroughly investigating this uh this drug trafficking organization, uh, you know, we come upon information that the members of the organization were involved in a, a drive-by shooting. This was a, a particularly nasty drive-by shooting. It occurred in North Philadelphia in the, uh, I believe it was in uh, the inter- intersection or the corner of Cambria and Hancock Street. And um, basically, there was a a group of individuals in a vehicle who jumped out. At least one of them had an AK-47. It was one of these rival drug-type drive-by shootings and uh, just unleashed a a hail of bullets from an AK-47. And uh, unfortunately, there was an 11-year-old girl who was an innocent bystander who took a round from the AK-47. Wow. Uh, according to her family, uh, she just narrowly escaped death. Got to the uh, the hospital. She uh, she did she did survive. What type of injuries? Yeah, it was a horrific thing. And in in looking at this, uh, we were able to determine that the uh, the sh- the shooter of of the little girl was a was a subject by the name of Alfonso Turek. Philadelphia police investigated and they had two eyewitnesses who had identified another person, uh, Eric Arango. They had identified him as the shooter in this case of the little girl. And in, in fact, that was a, uh, a misidentification. Was he a member of this gang, this drug gang? He was not. And uh, he was not part of this DTO. Um, and I, I don't believe he had anything to do with this uh uh, particular incident, but he uh, he was identified by uh, two eyewitnesses. Philadelphia police had arrested him, and he was uh, pending trial on that case. So, so I had this information, and I believed I had a, another shooter. I believe the wrong guy was, or we believe the wrong guy was a uh, was in jail. So I. I reached out to the uh, district attorney in the case who was, uh, she's retired now, Carol Sweeney, just a phenomenal district attorney. I explained to her what I had and she was, she was just uh, outstanding. And she says, cooperate every fact you can, put it in writing, give it to me and, uh, and we'll see where it takes us. And uh, um, so I did that and I went, you know, step by step and I was able to corroborate an awful lot of the information I had. And I was convinced that, that Alfonso Turek was the shooter. And that an innocent man was in jail and possibly getting ready to be convicted of this shooting. Well, he hadn't gone to trial yet, but he was waiting and I was in uh, touch with the detectives and I, I kind of like incorporated them, you know, obviously gave them the information, but incorporated with them in looking for the real shooter, uh, Alfonso Turek. And so together we investigated that part of it and uh, we were able to determine uh, there was a probation warrant that was out on Alfonso Turek and he had fled after the shooting. And uh, we were able to locate him in, uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, I passed a, a lead on to our our San Juan office out there. He was ultimately uh, arrested and extradited uh, for this back to Philadelphia. But uh, you know the uh, Philadelphia police played a big role in in, in all of that. Being able to uh, convince the DA when uh, our our team there working the case were able to corroborate everything that we had that uh, Alfonso Turek was, in fact, the shooter here. And ultimately, uh, Eric Arango was, uh, was released. And so, like I said before, um, you know, besides being able to take down a drug trafficking organization and dismantle the group, get, uh, get uh, a lot of convictions, but we were able to, uh, 
get some justice for this the, this poor girl and her family and uh, able to, you know, get somebody who was wrongly accused uh, out of jail. Did you ever have a chance to meet either of them? We felt at the time, you know, we had a very close re- relationship with Philadelphia police, and it was better just to let the uh, the, the police department and the district attorney's office kind of uh, handle that. And, uh, you know, so, you know, even in the uh, the media that came out, there was no mention of the FBI. And contrary to to some of the rumor out there, there are many, many times when the FBI just stays in the background and is not, you know, when it when it makes the most sense to do that. And uh, this was one of those cases. OK, yeah, absolutely. So um, but luckily working all of us uh, working together, including the definitely including those detectives in the Philadelphia police helped to uh, get the right guy arrested. The purpose of investigations is to put the right person in jail. Sounds like, uh, you know, they once they got the information, they had no problem whatsoever going after the right person. And that says a lot about Philadelphia Police Department. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, they I you know, I'm a huge, uh, a huge defender of task forces, you know, um, Later on with the uh, Joint Terrorism Task Forces that I worked most of my the rest of my career, you know, Philadelphia Police is probably our closest uh, partner and we partner with with a lot of uh, federal, state and local agencies. But, uh, you know, that relationship is just outstanding and they do an outstanding job. I agree. So. What year is this that you're working this particular case? Yeah, from uh, about 98, 99. So um, I was working on the drug squad, and then 9 uh, 11 occurs in 2001. You know, I, I remember uh, watching it when I was on the, uh, the drug squad, and, you know, like everyone else, you know, it, it certainly had a, a profound impact on me. I remember um, several, several weeks later, my whole squad went up to ground zero. And uh, anybody who who got a chance to see that and see the enormity of the destruction there, that without a doubt uh, had a had a uh, resounding uh, impact on me. Um, I also about uh, actually um, I believe it was two months in a day after 9/11. There was. A plane crash that happened flying out of JFK and uh, a plane that it was American Airlines 587. It was two months and a day after 9-11 had crashed into the Bell Harbor uh, area of Queens into a neighborhood there. It was horrific. Uh, The plane was was headed to Santo Domingo. Uh, Everyone on board uh, was killed and about five people on the ground. But immediately, because of the timing, everyone thought it was terrorism. And, and I, I remember. remember I was on the evidence response team and I was sent sent to Queens to, uh, uh, you know, to help collect the evidence in case it was a criminal or terrorist act. And, and it turned out not to be. It turned out to be a uh, uh, pilot error and uh, uh, that took down the plane with a rudder. Uh, uh, the rudder ended up breaking on it. But. That whole scenario had an impact on me. And, uh, you know, these were just uh, some of the things that, that were, were driving me to, to, to uh, look to transition to work, uh, work terrorism. I, I was working some of the uh, 9-11 leads, and I think the final thing that kind of pushed me over was uh, the American people expected the FBI to protect them from organized crime, uh, from gangs, violent crime, drugs. Uh, you know, and, the, and an agent has a lot of authority there. You know, you can uh, take someone's liberty, and that's, a, that's an awful big deal. So I knew that, but until uh, until 9/11, I always pictured the foreign threat more of a military threat, and I saw protecting our, you know, protecting our country was the job of the military, and uh, you know, all from going back to Pearl Harbor and the, uh, in, in, you know, the World War II attack, you know, I saw that kind of of attack as the military's role, but. Within the next uh, six months after 9-11, it became perfectly clear to me and to everyone else that the American public expected the FBI, uh, you know, and the CIA to protect them from from foreign threats and, uh, you know, uh, and especially terrorist threats. 
you know, and that was kind of like my convincing factor. I had never, ever considered working terrorism. I was a, you know, I had done nothing but criminal investigations halfway into my career. But I, uh, I you know, I just, uh, I saw it as a challenge and I felt strongly. So um, I went ahead and I transitioned over to uh, working terrorism. And the one thing that people listening need to understand, those are two very, very different investigative methods, tools, uh, rules, regulations. You know, the difference between working criminal cases and working terrorism or counterintelligence uh, cases are totally different. So you really had to relearn a lot of the policies, rules and regulations so that you know, you could do that to make that transition. Yeah, it, it was a uh, it was a very significant decision to for me. It took me uh, um, some time and a lot of a lot of thought to make it. Uh, like I said, I I never imagined working terrorism uh, until after that. But uh, but once I pulled that trigger and decided to do it, I uh, you know I I certainly tried to and, and think I gave it my all during that time and. Uh, I went over. I worked international terrorism in Philadelphia for a couple years, and um, and then uh, I was uh, promoted to a supervisory position in in headquarters in international terrorism in the extraterritorial investigations unit. And that was uh, that was in uh, 2004. I know you had John Cassens on here before. He talked a little bit about uh, extraterritorial investigations and the extraterritorial squad and. WFO, yes. but I thought maybe I would uh, maybe explain a little bit more about that if that makes sense. Yeah, I I really would because I and and I think he covered it, but I think it needs to be uh, we need to talk about it a little bit more because I don't want people to think that the FBI can go overseas and just investigate anything that happens to American that has some type of issue or trouble or dies overseas. So I think it's really important to understand what the extraterritorial unit is about, you know, what kind of jurisdiction that you have. So could you go over that again? Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so Congress has given the FBI jurisdiction to work uh, extraterritorial investigations uh, when a U.S. person is... Uh, a U.S. person or a U.S. interest, uh, meaning, meaning uh, an entity, a, a business or a U.S. facility, is the victim of a crime, and, uh, and that crime includes uh, terrorism. So, uh, so the FBI has that jurisdiction. However, in reality, the way that plays out is that uh, what we do around the world when we do have a U.S. victim of crime that occurs overseas uh, all depends on the country where it occurs. So depending on when, when these things happen, the country in, in many, many cases will reach out to the FBI and they, they may ask for a whole lot of help. They may ask for no help. But that country, in in most cases, uh, if not all, dictates uh, how much the FBI does. And uh, so what we did, you know, with FBI uh, uh, extraterritorial cases, what we try to do is we always operate through uh, legal attaches that are assigned to the different countries uh, around the world. So we have... FBI agents who are assigned to, I don't know what the number is now, but uh, um, uh, all over the world, we, we have agents assigned to these countries who represent the FBI in that country, and they are the, the point of the spear for the FBI there, and they're the ones who, who help determine how much, if any, help that uh, a country needs. Then in addition to that, we have extraterritorial investigative unit and headquarters that has a supervisor. The, uh, they break down the world by countries. They do the same thing with extraterritorial squads, the squads that the FBI has in their, in their uh, field offices. So you have a uh, WFO, Washington field office has one. New York has an extraterritorial squad, LA and Miami. And the world is kind of broken up. Uh, and assigned to those squads, basically depending on the country. So, for example, when I uh, when I got to the extraterritorial investigations unit, I was assigned Saudi Arabia, 
and Saudi Arabia fell under WFO's extraterritorial squad. WFO. So that's the Washington field office. It's not headquarters. It's actual FBI field office that is located in the Washington, D.C. area. I will try to stay away from acronyms, I promise. It's very hard. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, uh, so these uh, field offices, these four extraterritorials, they, have, uh, they handle the investigations. And, and really, in the terrorism cases, uh, in all cases, but especially the terrorism cases, what we're looking to do is if the country will allow, we're going to support them in any way that they ask. You know, the FBI has the ability, has a lot of resources and a lot of uh, special specialties that they can assist. If they ask for those, we, we try to provide them. And, uh, you know, and we're going to uh, try to conduct a parallel investigation you know, basically for the, the families of these victims, just to ensure if that particular country doesn't do a thorough investigation, does not uh, really bring the justice that is deserved, we have the option that we could prosecute uh, the case in the U.S. if that's where uh, the justice is redone. Now, m- most of the time, the vast majority of the time, the, the, the country does uh, a thorough investigation. And, uh, for example, in Saudi Arabia's case, you know, the, uh, the penalties for, for terrorism uh, are more severe than they are in the United States. So, um, so we just put ourselves in a position to to assist the other country as much as possible if we're able uh, to to conduct a parallel investigation. One of the extraterritorial squads will do that and uh, in many cases deploy over to that country to do that and uh, and have that option to uh, uh, to prosecute all or any part of that case if you know if we feel that 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 is needed. All right. Before you go into one of those cases, because I'd certainly love to hear about, you know, one that you can take us through. I want to be clear on what type of cases. So if I'm in Saudi Arabia and I'm walking down the street and I get robbed and and killed and in, in, in that robbery, would you be able to work on that case? It doesn't have anything to do with terrorism, doesn't have a nexus to terrorism at all. The The jurisdiction that Congress gave us is... You know, certainly for uh, significant cases, it certainly involves terrorism. Uh, you know, and many times ter- terrorism, terrorist acts involve kidnappings or murder and so forth where they can be charged. As far as uh, a criminal act, you know, cr- criminal act, I would rather leave that to someone who uh, who worked that when I just worked the terrorism. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, I think that when a U.S. sit is the victim of a homicide overseas, uh, I believe that jurisdiction would allow that in in certain cases, and there really has to be a you know an overwhelming uh, case where that where the host country you know basically was not uh, pursuing prosecution or not pursuing uh, justice, but. I don't want to speak for criminal cases because I didn't work them and I'm not right. uh, I'm not as familiar and I don't want to uh, step out and, and and say something that is not uh, uh, not right on. But I certainly do know that uh, Congress has given us those jurisdiction for terrorism cases. OK. All right. So I'm sure that you have a case involving terrorism that happened in Saudi Arabia that you can talk to us about. I'll just mention a couple of them. When, when, when I got there in Saudi Arabia, the, or got to uh, the extraterritorial unit in 2004, uh, Saudi Arabia was really a hotbed for terrorism at that point. Um, just from May until December of uh, 2004, there was a, at least uh, six terrorism attacks, terrorist attacks uh, by the head of uh, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula at that time. Um, this was a particularly barbaric and uh, brutal terrorist by the name of uh, Abdul al Uh He was better known as Abu Hajar, and he led, uh, I'll call it AQAP, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula at the time. And uh, there was at least uh, six different terror attacks 
where uh, a U.S. person was killed, you know, from the uh, initial attack in uh, Yambu, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about, to uh, uh, the attacks at uh, Al- in Alcobar, Saudi Arabia. So at Yambu, there was two Americans who were killed. At Alcobar, there was one. And uh, there was in Riyadh, you had a U.S. citizen that was uh, uh, shot and killed in, in June. You had uh, another two Americans who were killed, uh, uh, targeted and killed uh, in uh, June by this uh, terrorist organization. You had the uh, kidnapping and uh, brutal murder of Paul Marshall Johnson. And finally, the attack on the terrorist attack on the U.S. consulate in in Jeddah. And that was all in 2004 in uh, like an eight month period. I deployed on two of those cases uh, overseas. And, uh, you know, uh, I could talk a little bit more about uh, about Yambu and Paul Marshall Johnson, if you'd like. Which one would you like to do? Uh, I think I'll talk about uh, Paul Marshall Johnson. And um, this was uh, one that really... um, to this day stays with me and kind of, um, I wouldn't say reinvigorated, but really, um, you know, made me driven again to, to go after, uh, some of these, uh, terrorists. Paul Marshall Johnson was, uh, working for Lockheed Martin and he was over in, uh, uh, in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, working there, uh, when he was, uh, kidnapped by Al Qaeda in the Ra- Arabian Peninsula, and this was a really, uh, like I said, they'd had a bunch of these, and this was a, they made it uh, high profile. They immediately uh, posted it online. Uh, his picture uh, when he was kidnapped. Uh, this really hit home because uh, Paul was from uh, South Jersey, so he was just uh, over the river, and um, they posted his picture online. They. Uh, Basically dressed him in, uh, in the prisoner outfits that, uh, prisoners at Guantanamo Bay, at Gitmo were in, or at Abu Ghraib, in the orange jumpsuit, they blindfolded him. And, uh, after a couple days, they set a, uh, a 72 hour deadline, uh, to execute him if the, uh, uh, if the Saudi government didn't release all Al Qaeda prisoners that they had in their jail. Um, so the demand was very high, and, and, and everyone knew that that demand was not going to be uh, honored. That, yes, that, uh, I, I would absolutely agree. Um, at the same time, you know, the, the, the Saudi government and the U.S. government were, you know, wanted to do everything they could to try to, uh, uh, you know, try to save him. And, uh, you know, we did that. We, uh, um, we offer the the Saudi government every uh, you know uh, every resource that we uh, could have. We worked uh, nonstop during that time. We ended up sending over um, some uh, hostage negotiators from uh, our critical incident response group. We uh, uh, gave them the ability to use our or we. We were able to use our uh, uh, FBI laboratory for some evidence involved in that. We even, at the end of the day, ended up uh, sending over some FBI uh, canine handlers with uh, um, cadaver dogs and so forth. Uh, What did you know? What did you know about where he could be held, you know, where he was? Did you have any type of information? There's a lot of that that that, uh, that can't be discussed, but um, you know. But what I can say is that the uh, you know the Saudi uh, authorities were working uh, around the clock, uh, you know, trying to to find him, and uh, you know it was a, it, it was just a you know a horrible thing. Uh, we were uh, we we did not get to him in time. He he was killed. They they made that very uh, posted that. Uh, beheading online and, uh, mm. it, you know, just, in, it was just incredibly barbaric. And my prayers go out to the Johnson family, uh, as they did back then and always. As an investigator trying to stop this, trying, you know, so hard to get to him before this happened, can you talk a little bit about what that was like when you heard that he had been executed, beheaded? 
Yeah, you know, um, like I said, it, uh, it you know it, it was an impact on on all of us, uh, all of us working that uh, um, you know between the extraterritorial squad and WFO and all those at headquarters, uh, you know, pretty much working around the clock trying to get to them. We, uh, you know, the whole U.S. government was doing everything they could to to try to to help the Saudis get to them. They did uh, very shortly thereafter he was murdered. They did end up uh, finding the, the compound and they took out uh, Al Mukrin was, was killed by uh, Saudi forces, you know, within days of, uh, of Paul Johnson's murder. But uh, it, it was just a, a terrible thing, but it just uh, reinforced um, how important this the, this fight was, and this could happen to any American, it happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and, and it was horrific, barbaric, and certainly just made me know that uh, uh, I needed to continue to uh, to try to uh, fight this and stop as you know stop terrorism and, and protect uh, as many Americans as we could, try to protect them from any terrorist acts. That is definitely an example of the tremendous amount of uh, responsibility that the FBI has and why, you know, it's so important, um, you know, to have the support of the country as we, you know, try to, to win this fight. I agree. I think it's, uh, you know, as you can see today with some of the events that are happening here on our, our homeland, you know, the FBI's role is critically important in the counterterrorism mission. Uh, the JTTFs are, you know, are that tool. They do a phenomenal job. The best thing the FBI ever did was was initiating the Joint Terrorism Task Forces and, and basically using them as a force multiplier, you know, against the terrorism threat here in the United States. A lot of FBI agents, a lot of JTTF members uh, from all different agencies all over who have, uh, you know, committed their working careers to doing this, and they're working every day to, to try to prevent the next attack. I know you worked that, and then you came back again. Yeah, I came uh, back. I, um, I, I was lucky enough to uh, be sent over uh, to Australia for uh, right, right at the end of my tour at uh, headquarters for the management of serious crime, which represent the FBI in, in Australia. Uh, I was there for um, uh, at least a month, and they, they had a course, and it was uh, this course was called uh, Managing Multiple uh, terrorist attacks. And this was, you know, following maybe a year after the, uh, the seven, seven multiple terrorist attacks, uh, on, uh, the transportation send, uh, system in London. And, uh, so that was a great experience. I actually got to give a presentation on, uh, on, uh, Paul Johnson there. And, um, and who, who was putting on this, uh, training? Uh, this was the uh, Australian federal police and, uh, um, I was lucky enough to be selected and uh, represented the FBI uh, at this uh, course, and I think it was the 39th uh, Management of Serious Crime course that they had, and the FBI uh, usually sends one person every year. Oh, well, good for you. Good for you. So you came back? Um... Yes, I, I, I came back. I was lucky enough to get the domestic terrorism squad supervisor position, and uh, I I ran that uh for uh, a couple of years, and then I uh, transferred over to the International Terrorism Squad. I supervised that, and that squad uh, was focused on Hamas and Hezbollah. We worked some uh, very good cases there. I was uh, worked that for uh, a number of years, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, I, I finished up my last two years supervising the Organized Crime Squad, and I retired in uh, the end of March in 2014. And uh, why did you retire when you retired? Can't believe that you're uh, old enough for mandatory retirement. No, it wasn't. It wasn't mandatory. It was just uh, I. I loved every minute of uh, every minute of my law enforcement career. Um, I was uh, looking at the uh, next step. I told you I had worked terrorism for like ten years. It does uh, take a toll, and um, felt that. If I was going to move on to uh, to a next career, which I, I knew I wanted to do, uh, I didn't want to wait too late. I didn't think I would uh, uh, be as marketable out there. So so I started looking. It took me about a year, and then uh, 
uh, I decided it was the right time. All right. So what are you doing now? I uh, currently am the uh, Associate Director of Public Safety uh, at uh, Swarthmore College here in the suburb of Philadelphia. I'm sure it's a challenging position, but it sounds uh, a lot less challenging than working uh, in the drug war and in the uh, terrorism war. Uh, I would have to uh, say it is a lot less stressful. Is there any closing words that you'd like to say that can kind of sum up your FBI career and, and how you felt about it? You know, I'll just uh, I'll just say for anyone out there, any of your listeners who are considering uh, an, an FBI career, um, I came in uh, older than than some agents. I had already done uh, uh, over uh, ten years in law enforcement, and um, uh, so even if you're you know partially into a career and you just looking for something more rewarding, you know, there, there is no doubt uh, the FBI is a rewarding career. It offers you uh, tremendous opportunities to work around the world. And uh, I just uh, I feel blessed for the time I had. And I, I'd encourage anyone who's considering it uh, to make that leap. And that's the end of the show. As always, back at jerrywilliams.com in this episode's show notes, you'll find photos of Sam and links to newspaper articles about the cases he discussed. If you enjoyed the interview, please share it with your friends and family. Please share it on social media and make it easy for you. Right at the bottom of the show notes are all the social media share buttons so we can get this episode out into the world so they can enjoy it too. Now, I was talking to you about free copies of my ebook. So if you're interested, I need you to sign up for my crime fiction newsletter. If you go to my website on the sidebar, you can uh, sign up there or you can just wait for the pop up. Now, you need to understand that this offer is only good until July 31st, 2016. So if you're interested in being on my book launch team and getting a free ebook version of pay to play, you need to sign up for my crime fiction newsletter by July 31st, 2016. On August 1st, 2016, I'll be sending out an email to people who were already receiving my crime fiction newsletter, those people who signed up before I made this offer, and anyone who signed up between now and July 31st, 2016. And that email on August 1st, 2016, I'll be explaining what it means to be on the team and what you need to do to get the ebook. So I am very excited about this. Pay to Play will be released to the general public for purchase on September 20th, 2016. I have been working towards this for years, and I would love to have your support. So if you're interested, just sign up and let me know. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again next week for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.